let's get into this second panel of the day. Um, and, you know, I don't know about you, but um, my head is filled with the kind of stuff that we've already heard at quite high levels. Um, and I think what this panel is going to be interesting about is somewhat trying to land the plane of what we've been talking about at the public policy level into actual reality. And not surprisingly, we've described this panel as making age assurance a reality. Um, the other day I made a Freudian slip and I said, we're in the age of age assurance. What I meant was the year of, it, of age assurance, but I, maybe it is an, an age. It's maybe will take us an age to finally make this real because we certainly have been talking about it for at least two decades, haven't we? So anyway, we have an outstanding panel here um, who are going to help us make sense of this, both at a technological level, but also more of a public policy and actual industry practice level as well. And instead of me reading out their very impressive bios, which by the way are on the FOSI website, FOSI.org, if you haven't seen them already, uh, please go in there. Um, I'm going to just ask you, Asha, to say a few words to introduce yourself and what is it you're doing in this space? Thank you, Stephen. I'm very happy to be here back in my home city uh, after, yes, moving, moving to Brussels. I've been there for some time. So my name is Asha Allen. I'm the Advocacy Director for Europe Online Expression and Civic Space at the Centre for Democracy and Technology. We are a, a not-for-profit public interest organisation, um, making sure that international human rights law, fundamental rights, is found at the very heart and the very core um, of tech policy that's developing in different jurisdictions. Our colleagues in, uh, based in DC are leading the good fight there, and uh, I'm based in Brussels, targeting the EU and the European institutions with these um, as well. Uh, me personally, I joined CDT uh, not too long ago, about nine months ago, but nine months is a long time in mm. pandemic times. It, mm. can, it, it can take a take a blink of an eye, but also be quite some time. Uh, prior to this, I worked for many, many years um, with the largest women's rights organization in Europe um, as an expert in eradicating online gender-based violence. So this uh, topic for uh, online safety is incredibly close to my heart. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Yes. Hi, I'm Almudena, Almudena Lara. Uh, and I'm, I work at Google, so I'm very pleased that everybody is here today and I'm very happy that this, this event is happening, finally. Um, so my, my background is uh, in child safety spaces and working in policies for vulnerable uh, children. Here at Google, I lead the, the public policy work uh, in relation to child safety. And prior to that, I was working at the NSPCC, which uh, is the largest UK charity in child protection, and prior to that, in government. So I bring that perspective as well of government uh, perspective, having worked in many bills and regulations, uh, the charity perspective, and also now the, the big tech perspective. And although one shouldn't make policy on the basis of personal experience, I'm also the mother of an 11 and a 14 year old, which keeps me challenging. Uh, they, they keep me cha challenging uh, every day. They challenge me. And uh, I keep learning a lot from them as well. And uh, I've been at Google for two and a half years. And over those, uh, those two and a half years, the, the issue of age assurances has become much more prominent. Mm. Uh, so it's actually starting to occup occupy more and more of my day uh, at work, thinking about what, how do we get it right, what do we need to, to do, and how do we better serve children with safer and more age-appropriate experiences. And I'm really proud to be part of a company that actually prioritizes that and, and puts the effort into uh, thinking about those issues and about convening others that they can contribute to that conversation. So that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm really also very keen to hear from other panel members. Brilliant, thank you. Elizabeth. So hello, um, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Milovidov. Um, I'm saying that because Dr. Rachel McConnell <laughs> is there, and I love saying it. <laughs> You've all heard her speak. Um, I am really, really pleased to be here in person um, again. Um, I'm a lawyer from California. I have been a law professor in France um, and an e-safety consultant for the past 10 years doing work with the Council of Europe, uh, European School Net, so many uh, familiar faces. Um, also doing some work for FOSI last year um, and Microsoft. <laughs> 
more places. Um, but all of that came uh, to a stop uh, when I started with the Lego Group in November of last year as Digital Child Safety Senior Manager. Um, so I'm here with one of my colleagues, Karen Scott, um, and so we're just really thrilled to talk about all of the Lego digital experiences and what we try to do as part of the Responsible Child Engagement Team. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, thank you. There's, um, there's one of those TV production companies which at the end of their show says, not a doctor. Um, and I, I, I'm not a doctor, I'm afraid. Um, but my name's Ian Corby. I'm the executive director of the Age Verification Providers Association. We're a small trade body. We started in 2018, um, really because the UK was leading the way with implementing age checks for access to adult content. Unfortunately, um, the Prime Minister, Mr Johnson, decided he didn't want to do that. Um, but that is now returning. Um, but I think it's a sign of the times that we had half a dozen members when we started. We're now up to 25 members and growing um, at a pace. Um, I'm, I'm also part of the consortium running the EU Consent Project, which was mentioned earlier, funded through the European Union. Um, uh, I thought I was just part of the consortium, but the project coordinator, Costas, who's from a company in Greece called Upcombine, started calling me the project manager a little bit too soon in the project for my liking. Um, so I guess I have to take quite a lot of responsibility for what we're doing there, but not the technical side, because I really don't speak tech. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to have to say it now, aren't I? So I'm Dr. Rachel O'Connell. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry. So I've been working this area for about two and a half decades. My PhD was analysing paedophile activity on the internet and specifically understanding how they groom uh, children and their... Uh, trading of uh, child abuse images and way back in 1996 I was labeling what we are now calling self-generated content as cyber exploitation content right so we can talk about the dynamics of that in a little bit um, and then after the uh, my PhD then I worked with the European Commission and ran these pan-European projects and set up the first UK Internet Safety Centre which was up north in uh, the University of Central Lancashire and then we did further research to try and understand from kids perspectives what what they needed uh, in terms of internet safety education, right? And um, we factor analyzed a, a questionnaire we developed so that we could understand their knowledge of and rates of acquisition of internet safety and whether they um, adhere to the, the safety guidelines or not. And then, because you need to have that child-centric approach and you need to think about children's rights to feed back into policy making or suggestions around policy making. And then I worked within Bebo, a social networking site. If anybody remembers Bebo, <laughs> free Facebook. Uh -huh. I then saw firsthand, and the abuse management system is a full, full, full scale, pro-anorexia, pro-bulimia, pro-suicide. I was like, holy guacamole. So I worked with mental health organizations to say, listen, you should be delivering your services from within social media platforms. We should be enabling triaging of kids to the appropriate sources of help. And there's a comorbidity of issues that may exist for children. My background is psychology. So how do we help them? Um, and then for the last 10 years, 12 years, I think uh, I have been um, uh, a, 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 a subject matter expert on um, digital identity and digital identity attribute checking. How do we check the ages of people under the age of 18? How do we verify, for those very young kids, how do we verify when somebody says, I'm the parent or guardian of this child? How do we verify that that assertion is true so that that verified parent can give consent? So Trust Elevate is a child, I run Trust Elevate, which is a child age verification and parental consent uh, service provider. We're the first company uh, to do that. And it's built on a technical standard that I happen to um, be the technical author of and worked with some incredibly intelligent identity, privacy and security people over 18 months to develop the PAS 1 to 96 age checking code of practice, which is now in the process of becoming an ISO standard. Wow. OK. <laughs> um, and I, I just let's spell out our acronyms as much as we possibly can. I know I'm. ISO for, for folks listening overseas. Oh, it's an it's it's like ISO for uh, it's an international standard organization. So you have anybody working in cybersecurity you have to have ISO twenty seven thousand and one compliance, and you're certified against that. So similarly, we're looking for age assurance to be you have to be certified against it. Brilliant. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Asher. Then we're going to go down here, and then we're going to do open it up, and we're definitely going to come to the audience as well and to folks listening uh, remotely. So. Get your questions and comments ready. Asha, let's begin with the Digital Services Act and how it deals 
with age assurance um, in its due diligence chapters? Where, where, g give us a primer on that, at least, to get started. Absolutely. Um, I work in the EU context, and you mentioned acronyms, so I'm going to try my best Good luck. <laughs> not to throw thousands of acronyms at you. But the, the Digital Services Act, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, is the horizontal regulation that the EU just last week um, voted to agree in the European Parliament committee um, and by the member states as well. So the text is final, it's here, we're going to have this regulation and it covers everything to do with the legal content, content moderation. So in this context, the Digital Services Act is a two-pronged approach. It has very clear, strict obligations when it comes to illegal content, but very importantly, it's brought in these due diligence obligations. And this includes a lot of what was mentioned previously around risk assessments, how to mitigate those risks, providing access to researchers for data, for example, and independent audits so that we can address systemic risks um, uh, when it comes to online uh, content, user-generated content. And the Digital Services Act identifies protection of minors, which it doesn't actually define minor, but it does identify protection of minors, their mental health, their physical well-being, their emotional well-being, their development, as a systemic risk that does need to be addressed by very large online platforms. Um, so it outlines some provisions that, that can be done. Now, now interestingly, um, it prioritizes the highest level of privacy and security and safety for minors from the offset. Um, what it doesn't do is uh, mandate or uh, create obligations for age assurance in terms of age verification, for example, but it does suggest it as one of the measures that could be taken when mitigating certain risks. So mm. what we appreciate about the Digital Services Act, it hasn't been definitive in this, and an area that needs a, a very nuanced conversation and uh, needs to be uh, developed even further, but it has taken a kind of multi-pronged approach, which is you know, at the foundation of what we like to do at CDT, to have a very nuanced, comprehensive conversation about something that is quite complex. Mm. So the Digital Services Act is, is due to come into force in 15 months. Um, we shall see how it develops over time. I've been deep in the 400 pages of the DSA <laughs> for the last, uh, the last few months, so it will be interesting to see. But those due diligence obligations won't be able to come to life without the input of experts, academics, researchers, um, and at that kind of multi-stakeholder Well, in, in which case, how would you like to see this go? And how could, for instance, children's rights organizations be involved? So this is an, an incredibly important point. I mean, how CDT engages in this is to reach out to you know, child's rights organizations, different equality bodies, so that we can formulate comprehensive uh, you know, recommendations. Um, the way that I see it is that, and I'm from civil society, so this is gonna be of no surprise to you, that we need to be formalized when it comes to the enforcement and implementation structure. Often, Explain what that means in, in a European context. In the European context, you're dealing with a very complex organism uh, with 27, it still saddens me to say 27, member states. Um, and you have the European Commission, which is the proposers of the laws. You have the European Parliament. This is 751 MEPs. It's a lot of different uh, um, mechanisms going around. And so what this means, often there are times for civil society to engage through consultation. Uh, they may be brought on board for impact assessments and, and things like this. But not in every policy area is there a formal mechanism in which civil society are engaged when looking at the enforcement and implementation of different regulations. Right. And the Digital Services Act might be the first regulation that mentions civil society as many times as it does, hmm. because it recognizes that without that expert input, the due diligence obligations won't be able to be formulated in a way that needs to take into consideration the fundamental rights that need to be protected, because the entire EU Charter of Fundamental Rights needs to be respected in this way. So what I envision, what I'm going to be pushing for actually, uh, what I envision is a kind of formal advisory committee that may have specific expert groups in there to uh, oversee, help with the oversight of enforcement, mm. um, provide recommendations on implementation, help, be helpful when it comes to researchers and providing the access that they need and, and where the independent audits may go those due diligence obligations will not be able to come to life without some sort of formal structure for which they can be realized. The DSA is incredibly ambitious. Um, and in order for us to make it tangible and real, 
it, it's going to take that tangible and real commitment too. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that. No doubt we'll be coming back to the machinations of Brussels. But uh, in the meantime, Almudena, there is a sort of laser light focus on age assurance right now. Mm -hmm. um, what are the advantages and maybe the disadvantages of this strong focus? Yes. So um, I should start by saying that we w I definitely welcome that focus. And I think we, this is the right type of conversation to be that we need to be having here. I think uh, Asha talked about the DSA. Obviously, the age appropriate design code has, has also put a, a pin on these age assurances, but uh, it's also coming up in the new Europe, EU proposals for the fight against child sexual abuse and exploitation. It's uh, been discussed in the context of the online safety bill here in the UK. So it's coming up over and over again, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, for the right reasons and, and raising uh, the right questions about how it is that uh, we, we could and should be offering more age-appropriate experiences for children. So um, the, the, the difficulty here is that there is a bit of a sense that uh, age assurances might be the solution to all the problems. Mm. And uh, I think that that is where I see some of the risks and the disadvantages of this approach, which is that actually sometimes it can divert the attention over a more holistic approach that needs to be in place over how do we protect children and how do we, going back to what Asha was saying, how do we take into account the risks that are um, intrinsic, actually not intrinsic, that are present in some, some of our services, but how can we also work to minimize those risks and make sure that it, they are safer for children and for all of our users, maybe in ways that actually then diminish the need to gate children out of those experiences. So we can, as Alexandra said before, can keep them safe within the service, not out of, of the services. And in all this debate, I think we need to have a, a conversation about proportionality of uh, of the approaches. So there are many approaches, and we'll hear later from, from some of my fellow panelists, that there is a lot of investment and a growing industry on age assurances. Google is developing as well uh, methods of age assurance. We have an age inference model that uh, we apply in some markets. This is a market and, and technology that is growing and will grow even more in the next 18 months to two years. But the technology is one aspect of it. The other very important aspect that it needs to be brought in the debate is how do you apply it in a way that is proportionate to the risk that you want to mm. mitigate and that actually ends up uh, helping us balance the, all the rights that children have. So the right to be protected, but also the right to privacy and the right to participate. So all those piece there of participation, uh, uh, privacy, and protection that need to be balanced and, and we need to take a proportionate approach. Um, so that's, that's in a nutshell. <laughs> that's a big nutshell. Um, talk specifically about what Google is doing in this space. Are you j still just asking people for their date of birth? Uh, that's the starting point, and I think that um, is, is an important aspect of it. So when, when someone opens an account at Google, we ask them to, to tell us their, their uh, date of birth. And if someone tells us that uh, they are under the age of 13, we then direct them to our, uh, our supervised experiences, our family link offer, and they need to actually open that account with the supervision of a, of a parent or a guardian. If they tell us that they are between 13 and 18, we put them in, in a more protected experience that has some, some uh, default uh, protections, like safe search on by default, uploading of, of uh, content on YouTube to the highest privacy setting, gated content on YouTube, some protections that actually are offered for those between 13 and 18. And if they t tell us that they are over 18 in some markets, like uh, here in the UK and, and in Europe, we are applying an age inference model. So um, this age inference model is based on some of the information about their searches, their uh, YouTube uh, 
video history and, and other age signals that we have on the users and allow us to estimate whether they are likely to be over the age of 18 or under the age of 18. And that then allow us to put them in the right uh, experience. It's also important, so none of these models are perfect. Um, so it's also important that we, we give users the opportunity to tell us if they are actually, we have estimated, say, you, Stephen, that you are under 18, but you still want to access some of the, of the mature content on YouTube. Not, no porn content, there is no, no pornography on YouTube, but some of the more spicy videos there. But we might be gating you if we think you are under 18, but you still have the opportunity to actually offer some proof of identity that you are over the age of 18. Right. So there is also that route available to great. you. Great, great, thank you. Elizabeth, what's going on with Lego? Um, what's, your, what's the approach and what's verified parental consent? Yeah, so um, I think it's really important to, to stress that um, LEGO, uh, first and foremost, is the brick, right? Um, so as we have tried to um, create the, the safest um, physical product, that standard is what we're doing now with uh, digital play experiences. Um, and so you may have seen some of the LEGO games, uh, LEGO Life, which is a social media experience. Um, and really one of the ways that we ensure that children can have these safe and creative uh, online experiences is by having a verifiable parental consent. Um, and so what does this mean? It means that um, parents or legal guardians, they're controlling uh, some of the online activities, the, the, the features that the child can um, can engage in things like commenting or, or sharing on images. Um, and what's really excellent about this is that um, if the parent does not give consent, the child still has access, access to the digital experience, but without some of the features. Um, and so this way, um, I personally always like it when the parents and the child do this together. So that way they can have a conversation about it, about what they are going to be seeing, what features they're going to be enabling, uh, what's allowable, because then the child is, is able to um, participate. Um, I'd also stress that um, it's really important at the LEGO group to confirm the, I, the identity uh, of the parents, especially when we're talking about um, making purchases uh, where you have to be over 18 to have a credit card. Um, and even if you create a LEGO account, then you can go on lego.com and do shopping. So there's a whole world where you can kind of um, seamlessly navigate. But again, we really want to make sure that we know the age of the, the child, that we have the uh, parental consent, um, and eventually a Lego account. So talk about the Lego account. How does that work? And is it different for um, under 18s than over 18s? Yeah, well, you know, you have to remember that we have, um, they're called AFALS, um, adult fans of Lego. And so they do all- Wow, uh, no, that's a new acronym on Oh, me. that's a new one, okay, well. Any AFALS? Yes, there is. Wait, there's, hey, where's Allison? What is it about Lego? <laughs> I hate stepping on them, don't you? <laughs> Sorry. No, everyone hates stepping on them. But uh, I have to just do a little uh, a side note because I met someone, Allison from Google, who got engaged. Her engagement box is a Lego box. So shout out to Allison, her, her fiance, husband, and Lego for making that happen. Um, <laughs> Uh, we, so, <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to make any more personal comments. Go ahead. It, 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 that's the over 18s. I mean, it, it really is really 18s. an experience. Got yeah. it. Got it. Um, I, just one more side segue. I myself just bought the Van Gogh Starry Night um, that you can do in 3D Lego. These are the, the adult creations for Lego. So, go Lego.com. <laughs> um, so going back to um, the, the account, so really we have the, the Lego account is a, is a fully Lego compliant, uh, e-privacy, GDPR, COPA uh, compliant way for uh, children to have um, a Lego account and actually for adults to have a Lego account as well. Uh, you have your little avatar, uh, you have sometimes you have different names, uh, especially for the younger children where you don't um, identify the name, it's something like Charming King Green or something like that. Um, but at any rate, this is another way that we're trying to um, make sure that people are who they say they are mm. uh, and that they can do what they should be able to do. And I would like to just do a little twist on what um, Amadina was saying about age assurance. 
yes, it is so crucial, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have experiences that were appropriate already um, so that we didn't have to always be assured of the age. Um, things like what we're doing at the Lego Group with the Right Tech program, which is um, the responsible innovation of technology for children, where we're really looking at their digital well-being. Mm. Um, because if we put that first and we're creating these yeah. digital outputs, products, uh, play experiences, it doesn't really matter, right? Totally agree. <laughs> if we're totally boosting agree. their well-being um, at the right time, at the right age, it's child development appropriate. Brilliant. Thank you. Ian, um, talk about standards in this space. Uh, yes, so um, we, obviously we, we think standards are incredibly important because for a long time now, particularly in the US context, an age gate has been thought to be good enough. You know, you just you tick a box and say you're over 18 and we just believe you. Or you maybe have to enter your date of birth, but I've, I've even seen sites where if you enter a date of birth which makes you too young to access the site, it won't accept it. So you could just keep trial and error until eventually you're in. So, um, you know, there are age checks and there are age checks. So we want to make sure that there's a single standard that is recognised with different levels of assurance, so different levels of confidence. Um, and you might have a lower level of confidence required for accessing a Lego website. And I should say my addiction as a child was Lego. So social media may be addictions for some now. I just remembered how much time I used to spend on Lego. But yeah, so you'd have a I'll lower a level of assurance. support group later. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You'd have a lower level of assurance for that sort of thing or for opening a social media account um, which is something that perhaps the platforms themselves could be compliant with but then if you want to buy a knife online then we might want to take you right up to a very high level of assurance where we're yeah. looking at your passport reading the chip on the passport looking at your photo to make sure you're the same person as you see on that passport and and what the, that standard will hopefully allow us to do you know building on the great work um, that Rachel did um, with the the British standard is is map any new technology that comes along and there are so many ways that people are creating now to figure out your age online um, we can do it obviously you've heard of facial estimation which is very different from recognition estimation um, but also from how you speak your voice and how you type um, and some of these techniques can even be done on device mm. so you, the data isn't even leaving the phone or the computer if, right. if that's how you want if you're really really worried about privacy. So we can map all of these into standards and then we can talk to regulators about what standard they want, you know, so there's not too much of a regulatory burden on services to comply. And then services who want to implement age assurance can then go out and buy that based on those standards. And that's also a precursor to interoperability, which is what EU consent is all about. Um, because obviously you can't reuse an age check unless you have confidence it's been done to the quality you need. Anything else we know, need to know about EU consent for this audience? Well, just to say that we've, can, we've trialled it with 1,600 adults and children across five different countries to demonstrate it's possible to prove your age once with one service, one website, who might be served by a particular provider, and then reuse that same age check with a different site um, without having to take any further action. So, you know, otherwise age assurance is going to become like cookie pop-ups on speed. You know, you are going to have to recheck your age with every single site you go to, mm. sometimes for a particular page within a site, and clearly that's not sustainable. So we recognise as a sector, we've got to deal with this usability challenge. Um, clearly some of the big organisations, one of which is kindly hosting us today, you know, could step into this area. But we do think that there's a, a benefit to independent third party verification because it means you're sharing your personal data in a very, very carefully regulated and supervised fashion with a third party. And then all the age verification is privacy protecting. It's just a yes or a no. Mm. And we never disclose that personal data and we try not even to hold that personal data apart from a date of birth. Brilliant. Speaking of independent third parties, Rachel, yes. <laughs> tell us a little bit about Trust Elevate and what it can offer to this issue. Yes, yeah, so Trust Elevate, uh, we've been working on it for about four years and we were really, really careful to make sure that we're not relying on biometrics, we're not asking a parent to scan any documents, whatever. So we verify that a person is the authorised holder of parental responsibility for a child and you'll recognise that wording from Article 8 of the General Data Protection Regulation and we verify the age of the child so then a verified parent can give consent on behalf of the child to data processing. And why is that important? Let's get back to that self-generated. So platforms that enable live streaming 
their algorithms, the recommendation engines, detect, for example, I like comedy and cooking. So there's my For You feed is all about comedy and cooking. If I'm an adult with a sexual interest in children and I like looking at children streaming, and I'm can, I will be connected to those children in the, for, in, in, the, in the news feed or the For You page, the child has no choice. I'm also connected with other adults that like that content. So if you go on to a live streaming platform at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning or 2 a.m., you will see young children around the ages of 8 and 9. Some of them are having sleepovers. They set up their phones and they're like, we're going to dance, we're going to chat, we're going to this. And then you'll hear, hey, sweetie, you look lovely. Right? And there are guys that are acting in, as a pack. Right? So they say to the kid, will you do X? Will you do Y? Will you lick your lips? Will you raise your nightdress? Um, and the kids can see, because of the gamification of platforms and the likes that you can get, they can see the audience counter go up. Because these guys are like, hey, there's a live one here. The, the audience counter goes up. The kids are like, oh, my God. Because like, they maybe want to be an influencer in the future. Then the suggestions, you can hear these. Right? You can hear these guys asking the kids to do something. Spread your legs. Do I won't go any further, but you, you know where this is going. We've seen a fourfold rise in child sexual abuse material, and it's described as self-generated, which is a terrible misnomer because it's coercive control. Right? And it's a terrible thing to victim blame because that content is going to be online for many years to come. Imagine if it was your child or you're the child who's self-generated child sexual abuse material. Um, it would be better named if we thought about the, the relevant legislation, which is the coercion of a child in, in um, the Sexual Offences Act, or in US law, it's called the corruption of a minor. So we need to rename that immediately. But that situation highlights for you the present and urgent need for age verification on these platforms. And also there needs to be some discussion in relation. Also, if you refocus it that way, it, then the question comes up as, to what degree are platforms responsible because they're knowingly enabling this to happen, right? Is, are they accessories? I mean, I'm being deliberately provocative now, okay? But I just want to focus the minds to say, the reason we need this um, is that this activity has been going on online and is infecting millions of children over the last 26 years, for example. So we do need to, to think, we're right, we do need education. Um, and we do need to ensure that we have the appropriate safety by design principles, products and services. We should, we should be thinking about these things. Product developers, data scientists, and the commercial teams within companies should be thinking about these things and have a mechanism, like we have a data protection impact assessment, we need a child rights impact assessment, so that their decision making in relation to the features and the behavior modification is tabulated and recorded and subject to regulatory oversight. So we need to change the dynamics. And by enabling, when platforms know the age bands of the users, then they can create safer spaces. But it also enables the parents to have a voice. Because right now, parents are like, oh, please stop telling me about the bad things that happen online. I'm trying to manage kids. There's COVID, there's this, that, and the other. Then they can together mobilize and say, we were, and when you give parental consent to data processing, you keep, a, like Trust Elevate enables a consent dashboards. So you have a record of the date and the time when you gave or did not give consent to data processing, and you can go back in and change it at any point in time. This is incredibly empowering for the parents and the children. Teens can give consent on their own behalf. You then give them the tools and the records by which they can say, hang on a second. On this date and that date, this is what I said. And then you become the, 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 because the, currently there's an asymmetry of power between platforms and the end users. We're trying to level that up. So um, your point is really well made. It's not, age verification isn't the silver bullet, but it is an integral part of the, of the process. And there's an urgency about it because we do need platforms to say, okay, listen, we do know that we are connecting adults with a sexual interest in children to children, and terrible things are happening to those children, we should think about stopping that. I don't think we need to rate, I mean, there is legislation in place, the GDPR requires uh, parental consent and age verification, and there's the DSA, there, you know, there, there's lots of legislation out there. But really, I think there's a moment of reflection that industry needs to do to think, can we continue to enable that sort of harm to happen to children or young people? 
It's a really good segue to a general question. I'm just going to ask the panel, and anybody can jump in. Given all that's been said already and the challenge that Baroness Kidron threw out this morning, what are the principles we should bear in mind when designing age assurance techniques, policies, models? Who'd like to jump in? I'm happy to have a go. And please, everybody else, jump in if I don't get it right. Um, and I won't get it right, by the way, because we are here all in a process of discovery. So uh, please chip in. Um, so if I, I think building on what uh, Rachel was saying, I, I think that I'll pick, again, as a principle, this proportionality issue and the risk-based uh, uh, approach here. So in your example, I, I would argue, and I, I would agree with you, that a, age assurance can play a role. But if that role is to get those eight, nine-year-olds out of that experience, I bet that they might find a way to get back into those experiences. I think we also need to work to ensure that a, those predatory behaviors are not available in, in platforms. So to lower the risk across our services especially for children, but for all our users as well. And then we can build a system of age assurances that actually is proportionate to that risk. So Ian was saying to buy a knife, to gamble, to access mature content, it might be appropriate to ask someone to produce a, a, a government ID, but for accessing, I used this example yesterday, but accessing a video of Megan Thee Stallion, it might not be appropriate, actually. You might have a, a, a lower system of, of age verification that doesn't require mm -hmm. as much data on the user. And that's the other point that I, that I think is important in building the system, which is data minimization and purpose, lim purpose limitation as well. So making sure that the data that we collect is the minimum data that we need to collect for the purpose and that actually is only for that purpose so we we don't use it for other purposes i think it being built with the user in mind being user friendly child friendly so that people can use and engage with this system and i know that the eu consent has been doing a lot of work on thinking about designing for the user and the important point there is like the user as all the users like not only your standard user but like thinking about building a system that is inclusive so we know that for example if we only rely on government ids we create a system that actually excludes a big chunk of the population that either doesn't have access to government ids or might be unwilling for whatever reason to share that that government identification with with companies and with government and that is the other point is trust how mm -hmm. do we generate a system that it has trust and that uh, users can trust. Um, and I think that that will come from my last point, which is collaboration. I think trust will be built uh, and users will, will have more trust in the system if it is a collective effort and we all can collaborate. And, uh, and that's why I'm delighted that we are here, delighted that we are funding more research mm -hmm. and that FOSI will, will, will carry out that research because I think collaboration is the key. Thank you very much. Gosh, um, others, principles, yeah. Okay. Um, just because you, you, you're saying principles, and right now at the LEGO Group we're working on some design uh, principles um, and, and looking at how to um, t streamline this across all the digital uh, experiences. But what I, what I think is really interesting is that we're talking about age verification, and we mentioned uh, um, parental controls, and to a certain extent I feel like we should kind of pull it back a little bit. Imagine if we're uh, creating a cake, and I feel like we're so focusing on getting the sugar right and getting the butter right that we're not looking at the whole cake. And if we focus on creating a genuinely uh, holistic experience, digital experience for children that focuses on their well-being, uh, on their self-regulation, competence, emotion, we're going to get it right. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're trying to do right now at the LEGO Group is, is focus on um, the digital well-being of, of children, um, which will then lead into all of these other um, areas of this uh, digital play experience. And by doing that, I mentioned design. So we want to speak uh, to everyone from the 
the product designer to uh, the, the product lead. So that way, all of these principles are embedded uh, where they think about children's rights, um, where they think about child safety, child empowerment, from digital conception to digital consumption. Um, mm -hmm. th those types of principles are just top of mind from the beginning to the end. We're working on it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ian. Um, this is a transatlantic conference, and, and one thing I did want to take the opportunity to emphasize is that if you are compliant in the United States, you should not be under any impression that you are going to be compliant in Europe as well. So our standards here are different and, in fact, higher. And you know, possibly a slight difference of opinion with Elizabeth here, but yes, for sites which are directed at children, they need to be generally child friendly and may not need to have age assurance. But for us to be able to treat adults as adults and children as children online, then I think we do need to be able to make a distinction between the age of the users so that we're not all treated as children mm. um, and we maintain those freedoms for adults. And so I think there is you know, still a role for other sites and, and be very careful when you're looking at the Children Online Privacy Protection Act in the States, because that is you know, defined by if you know somebody is a child, you have to treat them carefully or if you run a site for children. Whereas in Europe and the UK, you know, you have to find out how old they are. You can't just have this don't ask, don't tell attitude mm -hmm. that if they don't tell me they're a kid, I can treat them as an adult. And it's a really, and I hear very senior executives from very large platforms, none represented here, I hope, um, still not getting that. And I think it's a really important principle that people understand in Europe, the principle is different. Interesting. Ashley? Yeah, I wanted to come in on this point because in the context of the Digital Services Act, the conversations were you know, more in depth because we have the general data protection, but we have the GDPR, we have the data minimization principle. And the DSA is very interesting in that. So one example I will pull from, um, in the DSA, it has now established that targeted advertising based on sensitive data, so the principle under GDPR, is now prohibited to children. But at the same time, it also says that you as a platform cannot collect more data in order to verify mm -hmm. that you are a child in this case because of the data minimization principle. And so the DSA has tried to strike this balance, mm. right? It's actually mm -hmm. what it's trying to do is capture all these discussions around principles that we have, the challenges that we still have, and giving room for those to grow, which is why I think you'll find the concrete provisions around child protection in the due diligence obligations. Because what it requires then are for you to develop these um, impact assessments. I'm calling them human rights impact assessments mm. because we're gonna make them human rights impact assessments. <laughs> um, but they're going to have to look at the deployment of different services, different products, take into consideration those systemic risks. And it's a process of ongoing improvement and development. And this is something I think is quite unique in, in the Digital Services Act. But it, it also recognizes that trying to think about all these principles where we are right now is mm. quite difficult to still do. The conversation is still ongoing. There are things that we have to be very aware of um, in terms of, of, of what we're thinking about. I think I wanted to draw from one experience, uh, one comment made on the previous panel about um, the understanding of the word artificial intelligence. We're also mm. developing the AI Act in the EU, which is, which is a, a, another question there. But thinking about, for example, some of the challenges that we may see in age verification where, you know, you have some systems that still have a difficulty kind of passing people of color. What does that mean for children of color? Um, we are talking about parental controls, but we're also talking about the right for children to access information. I'm thinking about children from marginalized groups who may need to access communities and information. So I think it also goes back to a point that Baroness Kidron made about it not necessarily having to be this binary. I think for those of us who work in that human, international human rights space, we're always trying to make sure there's a protection of all of the rights. This was our fight in the, in the DSA right. Mm -hmm. Set that foundation mm -hmm. and where you need to go into specificity, you find the mechanisms to be able to go mm -hmm. into specificity and they need to be able to grow um, and develop. So it's interesting we're trying to think about all of these principles in the context of a lot of regulation being built right now. But this is where I think a co-regulatory framework actually works quite well so that you can have the fluidity to be able to build on those. Brilliant. Did you want to add anything, Rachel? Yeah, just, just to pick up on the point, I think um, we've heard, I've heard a couple of times today that the notion that kids would be restricted or they, that they wouldn't be on the platform. 
And, um, and Elizabeth's point is that Lego is realizing, oh, let's create these spaces. And I think diversification of your portfolio, of your offering to kids is, is how companies are going to respond because um, the commercial imperative is you don't want to lose your users. You, mm -hmm. want, to, you want to cater for them and serve, and serve them. So I think the, the, the concern about participation, like look at the real world example. If you go to Alton Towers or, or an amuse, a roller coaster park, Right? If you're that high, you're not getting on the adult uh, roller coaster because it wouldn't end well. Right? So we have, we're trying to put stuff in the, in the online world in the same way on the back, uh, in the back of my house when I lived in London, every Saturday, these little small kids would come along and the parents would set up, or it was a football association. So you have little um, goalposts for the smallies and then the little ones that are a little bigger, and then the big teenagers played up on the upper uh, field, right? It's just creating safer spaces for those kids. Mm -hmm. They can still have risk. They can, might still get, somebody might mm -hmm. kick them in the shin, but they're learning how to play. So I think sometimes we have a narrative that says age verification is gonna restrict stuff. And I think we need to kind of unpack that and say it's actually a commercial opportunity. And the other point I'd like to make is having been a, a policy and regulatory person within industry, I know how hard it is to get the commercial people behind a thing because they're like, what, this is going to cost us money. This is a compliance cost. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. I need to, I need to make money. So when you talk, we, we have to build the business case for this. You reduce churn, right? Reducing churn for business is a really, really important thing. Building trust. So we have to put quantifiable measures in place so that when you're talking to the CFO or the commercial team, it makes commercial sense. And I think because sometimes it's seen as just a child safety, not re, you know, a cost, uh, we need to change that narrative and really articulate the benefits from a commercial point of view. There's sometimes a tension because you think, oh, we can't have a commercial benefit for the company if they're doing child safety. It's kind of something that people back away from. But in the experience, and, and I'm not the only one that's lived experience this, of trying to get companies to buy in to safety mechanisms, you do have to speak this, the language of the section of the bu business that you're dealing with. And one of the other things about age verification uh, and, and parental consent is it has applications across business verticals, right? It's not just for, so if people are trying, if um, under the payment services directive, for example, a child's bank account is a sub account of a parent's account. So if you want to enable a bank to bank transaction, you must get secure customer authentication from the parent and the child. Enabling that to happen seamlessly um, means that your, your business is, is going to, that your revenue growth is going to um, accelerate, right? So there are commercial benefits to behaving responsibly and deploying age assurance solutions. And that doesn't negatively impact on children, in fact. Mm -hmm. So you can protect children and also grow your business. Brilliant, and hold on a second. I'm gonna to come to the audience in a moment. Um, so, you know, what principles have we left out or missed? Or for that matter, what other questions are in your mind? And if you wouldn't mind just coming to this microphone here, that would be superb, Almedina. Yes, I, I just wanted to come in on what Rachel said, because I think it, it prompted me to, to think about some of the way we conceptualize these issues at Google. And I'm sure Mindy will pick, pick on these more at the coffee session. But it, I, I think you're right, like the, that there is an, we shouldn't see this as a risk and a way of gating children mm -hmm. out of experiences. But I think that the, the and, and we are different to Lego because we have a, a very wide variety of products, which is an opportunity. It's also, it offers also challenges. So we think of, like there are products that are not designed for children and that like where children shouldn't be. And for us, the challenge there is how do we make sure that children don't get into those products? At the other end of the spectrum, there are products that are designed with kids in mind and for kids' enjoyment. And we have YouTube Kids, we have a, a Google Kids Space, we have, and, and those, we want to nurture kids' participation, we want to make delightful experiences for them. That absolutely we want children to be there. And then in between there are mixed audiences services and we have many of those. So search, for example, is a, is a really useful tool for children to use 
in their research projects also. Like I know this through, throughout the pandemic, my children were directed to YouTube as well to learn about history or learn about, so uh, there are, and those are mixed audience uh, products where we really need to be nuanced about the approach that we take because those are where the risks of locking children out of experiences are most acute. So if we, if we were to just try to lock them, identify children to lock them out of those experiences, then they will be missing out on a lot of really valuable content. So the question needs to be as well, how do we identify them to put them within that product into a safe experience and or how we do, do we reduce the risk for all users in those products so that actually it's an, it's, it's an experience that is already appropriate for them in those mixed uh, right. audience products. Right. Ian, I'll come to you in a moment. Um, Ami, do you want to introduce yourself first? Uh, yeah, hi. My name is Ami. Um, I'm the CEO of Ranga, a digital parenting platform in India. And uh, I had a question for the panel, um, uh, and even for you, Stephen, in fact. Uh, as we are thinking about making age assurance a reality, are we also thinking about making it a reality globally? Are we thinking about making that hashtag Fossey global? And if so, how do we bring countries like India, South Africa, Brazil, the global south along in this discussion in co-developing and co-implementing? Because this does not work in silos. Mm -hmm. GDPR fails badly when a German flies to Goa because Indians don't know about it. Yeah. So are there any thoughts to that? I'd like to tackle the global question. Um, I'll answer just a tiny bit, um, especially for, for Ari, because one of the things that um, the Lego Foundation, which is separate from the Lego Group, um, just did a huge investment um, in a university in India. Um, and I think that those are the types of opportunities where even though it's not with the Lego Group, where we can um, piggyback on and, and share some of our best practices uh, of what we're doing here. So I do, I really hear your concern. I too am always championing um, I will say other communities, um, just because we really have to make this a global effort, a team effort. Mm -hmm. And and I would absolutely sorry. Okay. Please. Okay. No, I was just gonna agree with that. Being a global company, I think we absolutely need to find uh, global solutions in this space. Uh, and all, I'm like India is a great. Uh, market opportunity. It's a very young uh, country in terms of the population. It brings some different challenges so we do need to ensure that the solutions that we that we find are glo global but also nuanced enough so that also they respond to the cultural and social norms of the different countries and to how the different countries are making the different trade-offs between safety and privacy because not all like we know this from the UK Europe and and uh, the US, we know that not everybody's coming the same way in those trade-offs. So we need to work with, with those jurisdictions to really get it right, but uh, having solutions that can be globalized. Yeah, I would say your question is it's a, no, uh, your question is fantastic because this was at the heart of some of the advocacy we did in the Digital Services Act, which was, you know, this, this regulation is being made in this jurisdiction what is it's going to be its impact beyond this jurisdiction? You mentioned mm -hmm. GDPR. It's a fantastic example of, you know, policymakers cannot operate in these silos where this, okay, yes, this law applies to this jurisdiction, but actually what, how is it going to be replicated in other places? And where can aspects be taken of it which may not have as a, a deep impact in Europe that's going to have a completely different impact somebody, somewhere else, right? So one very quick example is a provision on legal representatives being liable, okay, if you have, a, you have a building in the island or somewhere else, this makes sense, but then becoming liable in another jurisdiction, that may cause issues for, for folks who, who may be there. So um, I think one thing that's quite important is looking to the international human rights law and human, international human rights frameworks that we have as a standard. This is at the heart of what we do um, and what we were advocating for, because when we were talking about the due diligence obligations and protection of, of children, we look to you know, the Convention of the Rights of the Child. We look to the UN guiding principles. These are huge frameworks that have benefits that we can already draw from to be able to, to build on these different aspects. And so we're trying to work with organizations based 
in as many places as possible to say, okay, how can we, one, as civil society, support each other's advocacy? What are the issues you're facing in your specific jurisdiction? And two, what messages do we need to take? And so in my case, to European decision makers to say, this may make sense here, but if this gets copied here, this is what it's actually going to mean practically. Um, and so there's a lot more space for us to, one, be having those conversations on a global level, but I'm also a lady of action. I like uh -huh. action five days a week. Um, and so how do we turn those conversations into concrete action um, as we look to have those conversations at a global level? They are beginning to happen. We have the Summit for Democracy, for example. A, a, Lots of different countries coming together to have these discussions, but what do we do with that? What's actionable and, and how do we move forward? So those were the two aspects I would say. Brilliant. Ian. Very quickly on the question, um, I, obviously I think international standards are important and I would in encourage people from other countries around the world to get involved in those conversations as we develop those standards because often we just don't understand local differences and we need to make sure they are truly international standards. Um, and then just a quick sort of point of clarification. Um, you were worried, Asher, about the um, you know, skin tone differences in estimation. You know, the way machine learning works is it's yeah. highly dependent on the training data. Yeah, exactly. So if you sh only show it a bunch of white people like me, it'll only be any good at estimating white people. So it's really critical. And I know that you know, Julie and Yoti have done a lot of work on this, getting a wide range of people. So they've now almost eradicated any kind of racial bias in their um, algorithms and, and, and we really need to get rid of any of these algorithms which are hanging around from days gone by when people were a bit lazy about this but it's not inherently biased it's just biased in the way you create it I just wanted to provide that piece of reassurance brilliant okay we are very fast running out of time um, and I'm gonna end by asking you all and you have 30 seconds to respond um, 30 seconds or less. If you had a wish or a magic wand that would break through a particular challenge or concern or worry to make age assurance a reality, what would it be? And Rachel, I'm going in reverse order this time, so you start first. Okay. Uh, for adoption, for us to be able to demonstrate and systematically go through the arguments for and against and get all of the parties in and articulate the benefits and then listen to children and, and, and their views on how this has worked. We're doing a lot of work with um, uh, organizations that teach kids how to code and they're deploying the age verification and uh, consent and their feedback is really powerful. So I want to elevate that as, so that we actually listen to the people that we're putting these things in place for um, and so that people understand how what their concerns are but mostly what their positive views are around this. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I'd like a time machine so we can jump <laughs> forward three years because I wanted to reassure people I think this is only a temporary issue where lots of people are striving to implement age assurance. It's going to become such a ubiquitous, ubiquitous general requirement for websites to know how old their users are that actually we're going to have to make this a single interoperable simple system and it you know it was gambling and pornography who took the brunt of it to start now it's social media many of whom are here in this room but increasingly it's going to be everybody who needs a solution to this and we will find a solution and hopefully we'll work you know, in complementary terms with everybody else in this room to get to that point excellent thank you um, I don't have a time machine, uh, I wish I did, but I would say um, flipping the business model. Um, and, and by that, I mean really best interest uh, of the child as a, as a lawyer. Um, I can promise you children's rights are at the top of my mind when I'm doing my projects. Um, and I really want to embed that all the way through the Lego group and then to other industries so it kind of spreads as this fun virus, if you will, um, <laughs> where we really um, think about children first and their futures and not what's going in our pockets. Nice. Yeah, I want children to have great experiences when they use technology and, and for them to be in uh, making the best use of, of technology. We as companies also need to take the responsibility of build with them in mind and listening to them. And I know we do that a lot and Mindy will say more about this later. And that's also like I think my my magic wand has worked because we also got the research that you are gonna do with kids and families and uh, learning more about that. So that's brilliant. that's brilliant. Okay, Asha. Um, I wouldn't give me a magic wand because I'd do a lot of things with it. But um, <laughs> no, I I would say I'm gonna bookend uh, with with Rachel here in um, wishing for 
a very in-depth, multi-stakeholder approach where we can be nuanced, where we can be constructive, where we bring different folks to the table. We, as the adults sitting here, uh, the young people watching us and the young people joining us don't live simple lives. So there are not simple solutions to what we what we are aiming for here. Um, so, so what I would ask for is for us to be uh, deliberate, holistic, um, and to understand that we are dealing with uh, aspects that need to be dealt with systemic societal change at its very heart, um, but also that there are solutions that we can come up with together. Excellent. I, just because I'm moderator, I'm going to give myself a wish as well. Uh, my one wish would be that all of you who come to our conference in November will, will wish you up like this and take you over. Ami, this has been a transatlantic uh, conversation. This uh, November will be a global conversation. You're very welcome to attend. Um, but first, let's thank this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. Um, it would be remiss of me not to thank our wonderful hosts once again, Almadena and her extraordinary team. Thank you, Google, uh, for, for putting us up in this fabulous place. Fabulous food, I believe, is waiting outside for us, too. And Mindy is going to take us through uh, some very interesting developments that they've been doing. Um, thank you again to our uh, support, no, our sponsors. Where are TikTok? Are they? Alexandra and to Eric, thank you very, very much for the financial support that flew us all over here. So uh -huh. appreciate that. Yoti as well for uh, being a partner to us uh, in this event. Um, the rather remarkable speakers and panelists that we've had throughout, it, I nearly said throughout the day, it, I, it's only been a morning, but it's, <laughs> and this is in a positive way. It's felt like it's been a long day, but in, in a good sense. Uh, it's certainly been remarkable to be back in person uh, oh, yeah. doing this. Maybe we just doing a half day was just right. I think a full day would have uh, it would have exhausted me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Glad it was just a half day. Um, and also, um, once again, the the logistical teams, the folks who are working all the wonderful knobs and whistles in the background there. Thank you very much. <laughs> and now I'm going to embarrass the hell out of my colleagues. Where is Emily Mulder and Maria? Conticelli, you will stand up, please. <laughs> Don't tell me they've run away. Oh, there they are. There they are. <laughs> Thank you both for everything Yay! you've done. <laughs> Two better colleagues you would not, uh, I mean, they've been amazing. They've put up yeah. with me for a start. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I guess what's really interesting is that um, we have all showed up. I said the morning, this morning that 80% of success was just showing up. So we have to do the next 20%. Um, and we have heard a lot of great ideas, and not just ideas, but real practical solutions for how we can become more successful in this space. Yes, it's incremental, but increments are better than nothing or going in the opposite direction. So let's at least keep making those small steps, and then they become, as you look back from your time machine, oh my god, we really did move some space in those five years. Because folks, we got Web3 to come up to terms with, and the metaverse, whatever that M word means to you, it is going to be even more challenging as we're getting into that place. So thank you all for showing up. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for viewing from uh, afar. Um, you know, we are energized by your commitment and the extraordinary work that you all are doing in your various places. Please join us in Washington in November, another shameless plug for the conference, and we will share even more of what's going on around the globe uh, in this space. Thank you all, and we'll see you at lunch. <laughs>